Ladies and gentlemen, we are holding this press briefing in a empty UN city building as staff are working now remotely as a social distancing measure due to the coronavirus. The lives of millions of people in our region are undergoing radical change. There is, quite simply, a new reality. The role of public health services is understood. The value of health workers is appreciated like never before. As of today, 152 countries across the globe are affected by this new virus and over 7,000 people have lost their lives to it. One third of globally reported cases are in the European region. Europe is the epicenter of the first pandemic of coronavirus and every country, with no exceptions, need to take their boldest actions to stop or slow down the virus spread. Boldest action should include community action. Thinking that this does not concern me is not an option. The good news is that the region is alert and on guard. Mm -hmm. Preparedness, readiness and response measures on multiple levels have been launched in all our member states. We monitor those measures on an ongoing basis and hold regular consultations with counterparts in health ministries to gather and share helpful information. One of the most frequent questions I get asked by our member states these days is, are governments doing enough to stop the epidemic? And the second question, are governments doing too much? Is it justified? To answer this, let me set out a few points about the scale of the response in Europe. First, we are dealing with four seas scenarios of the outbreak. No case, first case, first cluster and first evidence of community transmission. The outbreak is progressing at different speeds in different countries, depending on demographics and other factors. Some of our member states are in scenario two and three, many are in three and four. But the basic actions in each scenario are the same, but the emphasis changes depending on which transmission scenario a country is in. Every single country must assess their own situation and context, including virus spread, measures in place, and social acceptability and adopt the most appropriate interventions. However, all should work to, one, prepare and be ready, two, detect, protect, and treat, three, reduce transmission, and four, innovate and learn while protecting the vulnerable people. It is not an either-or solution. It is a package of comprehensive measures that can bring the best results. At every step, the public should be informed and guided on how to protect themselves and others, support their communities, and maintain a sense of normality in extraordinary circumstances. Health facilities, have, have to have the necessary equipment to care for those seriously affected and to protect health workers from exposure. We are fortunate that across Europe, many countries now have national response plans with efficient multi-sectoral measures and strong laboratory testing capacity. The experience of China and others show that testing and contact tracing combined with social distancing measures and community mobilization, when put in place quickly and effectively, can prevent infections and save lives. At the WHO Regional Office for Europe, we provide technical expertise and guidance, collate and share information and innovation with all 53 member states, working with them around the clock. As of today, we have sent experts teams for hospital preparedness, coordination, health sector planning, laboratory services, preparedness and readiness and rapid response on some 40 missions in countries across the regions on their request. We have also a strong team on the ground in Italy, both in Rome 
and at the WHO Venice office. We are working with global outbreak alert and response network partners and emergency medical teams to scale up capacity to respond to an increasing demand for support on the ground. WHO is monitoring the potential risk of a disruption to medicine supplies, focusing on essential medicines critical for primary healthcare and emergencies, including antibiotics, painkillers, treatments for diabetes, hypertension, HIV, tuberculosis. WHO delivers laboratory equipment, medical devices and personal protective equipment to countries in need. We are aware of some critical shortages and working hand in hand with partners like the European Commission, the WHO globally and the private industry to tackle this. We are working with manufacturers increasingly on also increasing the laboratory testing capacity. I want to stress that the demand and the need for our support is growing. Resources are critical to sustain our effort so that no one is left behind nor at the sidelines. Everyone in the society has a role to play, not to be infected yourself, and if you are infected, to protect the other ones, especially the elderly and the people with underlying medical conditions. These are unprecedented times. It is important that countries work together, learn from each other, and harmonize the efforts. The virus can be beaten back by solidarity within communities, within nations, and within our region, together with individual psychological resilience. Thank you very much. Uh, questions rolling in um, at the moment from the from the press so I'm going to go straight away with the first question um, which comes in from uh, Carmen Pound at Politico and there are three questions here and I think these are best maybe sent over to uh, Richard or delivered to Richard uh, uh, Pebody who's online I'm trying to understand what are the issues are there not enough testing materials how exactly do these tests work and what companies, institutions provide them? Are there any reliable self-tests available on the market? So we'll go over to Dr. Richard Pebody to answer those three related questions regarding testing. Richard, please. Yeah, thanks very much, Rob. Um, so WHO, since the, the beginning of the outbreak, has been working um, extremely hard um, with all uh, the member states to ensure um, that laboratories uh, were prepared uh, and had uh, tests in place or mechanisms to refer samples from um, suspect cases um, to ensure that they were rapidly tested and results available to really help inform local public health measures because as you heard quickly and rapidly identifying and testing cases is one of the key elements of uh, this important public health response. Um, as countries have progressed through the different seeds, um, particularly into the stages of community transmission and numbers of cases mount, then there can be challenges in terms of um, accessing enough tests to, to uh, meet the local demand. Um, and that has happened, we're aware, in some countries in Europe. And we're working with those um, member states to uh, advise them. And uh, countries have made decisions to focus testing on the more severe cases. Um, but in hand in hand to that, clearly the measures still need to be in place to ensure that um, individuals who have clinical symptoms still self-isolate uh, and their families, if, if need be, also go into quarantine to, to, as part of the blended strategy to try to reduce um, transmission and prevent onward spread. To, to deal with the question around how exactly these tests work, um, they're all based on the uh, detection of the virus um, in samples from the respiratory tract. So it involves um, taking samples from the respiratory tract and those samples then being tested um, in, in local laboratories. Um, and th there is work underway to try to develop um, self-tests 
but really the, the gold standard are, are the, the tests which are undertaken in um, the, the laboratories themselves. But uh, we're watching with interest uh, the developments around self-tests uh, because that, that may play a role in, in, in the future. But just to highlight, again, one of the key elements of the strategy really is around um, testing patients. And uh, WHO is committed to ensuring that that does happen over and out. Great. Thanks very much, Richard. Um, I've got another question here now from, um, we have Jenny Fink at Newsweek, who has asked, uh, can you provide an update on new confirmed cases in Wuhan, please? Does the reduction in cases show the quarantine measures worked even though it's spread across the globe? I'm going to go over to Dr. Dorit Nitsan to answer that question. Dorit, please. Dorit, I think you're on mute. Uh, Dorit, mm -hmm. you yes. Okay, well, now we can hear. Yes. Thank you. Please uh, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And uh, yes, indeed. The numbers of the number of cases in Wuhan and in China in general are decreasing as we speak, and these are great news. Uh, but also, we see that the numbers outside of uh, China are superseding the numbers in China now. Uh, what we learned from the uh, our WHO office in China and the Chinese authorities is that the uh, actions that were taken, the measures, are very uh, much involved also in containment and mitigation, what we call containment and uh, mitigation, and that each country needs to assess the situation and to implement these packages. Not, it's not one side fits all from one side, and from the other side, it's not one action that helps. So social distancing alone is not enough. What the Chinese told mm -hmm. us is that all the actions that our regional director just mentioned should be done together in a combination. So thank you. I hope I answered. Thank you very much indeed. And I've got another question, follow-up question here, which is to, to you, regional director, to you, Hans. Um, should Europe respond more as one? Should there be more unity? The solidarity is a call that WHO is standing very, very strong for. At one hand, it is normal that in the beginning, countries are responding more, let's say, in an individual way. Every country context is different, and they have to do their own risk assessment, where WHO often is part from. But as we are moving forward, the unification and the synergizing is coming both naturally and more and more also recommended by the WHO. Solidarity is key between the countries, but also within the country. For example, to take care of the elderly population. Thank you. Thanks very much, Hans. Uh, now we have a question from Rafael Seraceda from Euronews. Uh, these are two questions, I think, for uh, Dr. Pebody, for Richard. Um, you're online, Richard. Uh, the two uh, questions are this. What is making it so difficult for European countries to widespread test the population? There is a growing sense of injustice as leaders, celebrities get tested. And the second question is, are there any updates on the influence of asymptomatic cases as a driver of infection? Any new estimates on the percentage of mild asymptomatic cases? Richard, please. OK, thanks, Rob. So the, to answer the first question, which I I think it will partly covered with my initial answer. Um, the issue of um, access to tests, um, again, we need to bear in mind the stage at which countries are at. Um, as we get towards the stages where there is a widespread community transmission, then there may be issues around access to tests. Um, and it's important there that countries prioritise testing for specific groups, particularly those who are, are hospitalized and are more seriously unwell, um, and those with mild illness, um, assumptions can be made that those are very likely to be cases of COVID-19, and those individuals would then need to self-isolate to prevent onward spread. To deal with the second question, the role of asymptomatic transmission, I mean, what's becoming clear is that um, this is obviously a, a, a very transmissible virus, um, and that there are certainly people are infectious for a 
day or two or period before the onset of symptoms, what we call pre-symptomatic transmission. Um, the role of purely asymptomatic transmission, people who don't develop symptoms at all, that's um, not totally clear, but it's unlikely that's playing an important role in transmission in the population overall, overall. Great. Thanks very much, Richard. I've got a follow-up question, actually, which is related to that and the previous testing uh, question from Josep Corbella at La Vanguardia. Um, Spain had given up on testing all suspect cases because of a lack of testing capacity. Today it has announced that it plans to start testing suspect cases again in the next few days. Has WHO helped in increasing Spain's testing capacity? If so, how much testing capacity is Spain expected to achieve? I don't know whether you can answer that, but I think you're the most relevant person on the panel to do so. Yeah, and I'm still here, Rob. Yeah, no, th th thanks for the question. And um, it, obviously, very good to hear that Spain are um, extending their testing beyond um, their current current target group. Um, I'm not aware that WHO was directly involved in provision of the the, um, the kits for that, and that may well reflect access to additional testing ability locally. Um, but it, again, it, just to reinforce the key message that testing is a, such an important part of the control strategy, but that it's, it is a blended strategy and it needs to be part of these other measures, including um, self-isolation of symptomatic individuals uh, and social distancing measures to reduce the spread of the virus uh, in the population. And these other measures, which everyone can do, is around sort of good respiratory hygiene and regular hand washing. All these combined together can help to fight the infection and reduce spread in the population. Thanks very much indeed. Um, the next uh, question I have is from Kristina Bozic from the Slovenian newspaper Vecher. Um, and it's to you, Dorit, uh, specifically to you. If medical staff and hospitals are stretched and faced with increasing number of patients, is it not better to focus on other procedures and not on testing? If not, why not? Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, we can. Yes, yeah. okay, great. Thank you very much. And indeed, it's a very important question. Uh, we are trying to uh, to really lower and flex mm. pressure. And uh, that's the, the, all the actions that we are describing are uh, actually aiming to get the milder cases outside the hospital, while the more severe ones will be in the care and receiving the care that they need. For that, it's very important for us that uh, the healthcare workers will be able to be, first of all, protected, well protected, and be able to provide the care that is needed in the hospital. So it's important to test the patients that are arriving into the hospital to know and identify them, to do all the, the contact tracing outside the hospital while in the hospital focus on the care. Some of the health systems already prioritize the care and ensure that all elective surgeries and elective and the procedures are postponed while the focus is on the corona patients and those who need the acute care. It's important to continue to provide the acute care. People do continue to have uh, other diseases. So we cannot only focus on corona, but we have to prioritize the mm. workforce at the forefront, protect them and protect the other patients in the hospital. I hope it was clear. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much. And a follow-up question for uh, Hans with regard to the tests um, and, and Dr. Tedros's call to test, test, test. Um, could, uh, this question is also from Christina Bozic at um, Newspaper Vecher. Um, could, is there any opportunity for all authorities worldwide to receive testing free of charge? Um, and uh, what would, uh, in your opinion, how could we encourage governments to test, 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 as Dr. Tedros has highly recommended? Right, it comes back to the strategy that we know which works to turn the tide against the epidemic. Number one is to contain the outbreak. Do aggressive case finding, which means then 
diagnosing, putting in quarantine, testing, number one. Number two, strengthening the health system capacity for the influx of more patients. Number three, the whole community mobilization with social distancing. So when the country has the capacity, indeed, the testing is to be expanded. First and foremost, it is of according to the WHO case definition. WHO has a clear case definition. And then contacts of probable and confirmed cases. Now, if a particular country faces limitations, of course, in the testing capacity, because remember, our region encompasses not only the EU, but the 53 member states, then in the healthcare settings, there may be a reason to prioritize. And particularly when we talk about closed settings, because WHO also recently published guidelines how to address the coronavirus outbreaks in prisons, which is very important also in uh, our region. If it is uh, to be tested free of charge, within the Sustainable Development Goals, we strongly believe into what we call universal health coverage. Universal health coverage means that everyone in the population, independent of age, of financial means, of uh, race, of origin, has to have equal access to healthcare services without being pushed into the poverty due to ill health, which includes diagnosis and treatment. And all heads of state of the WHO European region have signed off on universal health coverage and the Sustainable Development Goals. Thanks very much, Hans. Uh, the next question comes from uh, Adrian Gopin from Pro TV Romania. And it reads, uh, for all of us who are not infected with COVID-19, what is the preventive treatment that you recommend? Is there anything like that? And that's over to, I think, probably Richard. If I could go to Richard, please. Yeah, no, sure. So, um, yeah, uh, for those of us who aren't infected, what to do? Um, so there's really um, very simple measures that we can all do to reduce our risk of being infected and indeed reduce our risk of infecting others, which is also important as well. Um, and that's just these very simple measures of washing your hands regularly, having good respiratory uh, etiquette in terms of uh, catching your coughs and sneezes, um, staying at home, importantly, if you fall unwell with an acute respiratory illness so you don't spread it to others, um, stay your distance from others, with social distancing, um, and really follow the guidance as well as it changes from your national government. And obviously, different governments are introducing different measures as um, the epidemic unfolds across the countries of the European region. Right. And, and, and with that, now I've got you on, Richard, maybe I could just follow up that because we've got a, also from Joet uh, Giovincho, uh, the uh, Fox medical team has asked, do you consider dental procedures like teeth cleaning or even drilling an aerosol generating procedure? Uh, I think also you're the most apt to answer that. Do, would you like me to repeat that? Did you get it? I did. Um, well, again, I, I mean, clearly, if you are unwell, then you shouldn't be um, going to your dentist if you've got an acute respiratory illness. Um, and obviously, dentists take appropriate precautions in terms of um, masks and so on. So uh, I think all in all, uh, you know, the, the dentists should be um, protected um, and certainly haven't that we're aware of in reports of uh, transmission episodes in those type of settings. But obviously, something we need to sort of be aware of and, and watch carefully. Okay, thanks very much. And uh, next question is from Fiona Keating at Meetings and Incentive Travel uh, Media Outlet. I, I write for the meetings and events industry. What advice would you give to event organizers on holding events and conferences? Is it best to postpone and for how long? Uh, Dr. Dorit Nitsan, I will hand the floor to you, Dorit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it is one of the, of the interventions in the package that we recommend to reduce transmission. It includes also the social uh, distancing, such as cancelling sporting events or other events that are non-essential. So, yes, 
we do recommend when the country allies to this scenario, when it is in community transmission, to as part of the full package, to also introduce the social distancing so that everybody will know what to do. We always have to remember that those who are sick or suspect should mm. be uh, uh, isolated and the contact should be traced. However, the whole society should take the measures and follow the instructions from their uh, authorities. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dorit. Um, okay, so we're on to um, Camille bass Wallet from AFP. Um, we have a question here from Camille on, for Richard about post-mortem tests. They're not carried out everywhere. Does it have significant influence on the number of deaths recorded? Richard. That's a good question. Um, to be quite frank, it's difficult to disentangle. Well, obviously, um, countries are reporting uh, the unfortunate individuals who have died with um, novel coronavirus. Um, many of those individuals will obviously have been diagnosed in hospital um, and will sadly have not survived their illness cause. So have been diagnosed while they were alive rather than at post-mortem. Um, again, I'm not aware of any individual studies that have been done amongst um, individuals um, who have died and where coronavirus wasn't sort of diagnosed before birth or sorry, before before death. So I, I'm not able to sort of give a, a specific answer on that point. Okay, thanks. You might be able to help us here. We have Naomi Christia from Bloomberg who writes, uh, how does WHO explain the discrepancies between death rates in different European countries? Why is the death rate in Germany so much lower than in Italy, for example? Is this an issue with how deaths are classified, with patient demographics or with hospital systems? Does WHO expect these discrepancies to persist as the pandemic continues? Okay. okay no, thanks. No, it's, a, it, it's a very good question and something which um, is obviously causing a, a, quite a lot of debate. Um, we, at this stage, don't have a, a true answer, and it's probably a combination of those factors that um, the questioner outlined. So uh, clearly, there may well be local differences in the way deaths are being ascertained, a, a little bit along the lines of the, uh, the, the question that was raised before. Um, but equally, there are likely to be differences in the way cases um, so infections are being detected and reported as well. We, we know already that in some countries, more severe cases are being tested, but not milder cases. So that will obviously affect the ratio of um, the case fatality um, ratio. Um, the other point, of course, is that those differences um, in case fatality ratios may be real. Um, and that might reflect um, a range of factors. It might be because the demographics of the country mm -hmm. is different. Um, countries may have more elderly people, and so um, they're seeing higher death rates. Or it could reflect differences in, in levels of care. Um, and, um, you know, in some, some places it, it, they, they, that might be potentially struggling in, in managing, um, then the, the, the case fatality ratios uh -huh. may be higher. So at this stage, we can't give a clear explanation, but it's clearly something which is going to need further investigation to try and pin down whether those differences are real and what might be underlying underlying that over and out. Thanks very much. And Dora, did you want to add anything to that response? No, I, actually, I see the full picture that Fisher just said. So it, it has to do with the population and, and with the, also the death association, as Fisher said, because in some places, in these people that in, in some communities have other background diseases, sometimes it gets diluted or more pronounced. So we, it requires a really good look in each country's data in order to pin down the causes, and we will do that. Great, thank you very much indeed. Okay, so the next question comes from Wei Wang from the Chengdu Economic Daily, and uh, it is the question is this: It seems the countries in Europe have different ideas and strategies, such as group immunity, from WHO's recommended approach. Why is that, and is it necessary to push forward a unified policy? 
which of you panel members would like? Hans, can we hand that to you? Yes, thank you. Thank it you. relates a little bit to a question that we yeah. previously heard. We do see an alignment of policies now, both on the health policy, but also other important issues like the procurement of the PPE, personal protective equipment. Definitely, the solidarity still can and should be stronger, but we see a positive dynamics over there. Their WHO is also using its convening authority to have the countries around the table, like we did a other attempt in the morning. So there is a hunger by the member states to document first and foremost what are the measures being put in place. And then, rather than having a detailed common agreed action plan, we would go for a common set of principles, which then every country is to adapt according to where are they in the outbreak, according to the four C scenarios, and also the context. There should always be a balance between protecting the public health of the population, the social and economic implications, and the human rights. Thanks very much, Hans. And actually, a follow-up question also from Wei Wang that maybe you could answer is, what will WHO, what will WHO do to address the severe shortage of medical protective and treatment equipment in European member states now needed to contain the COVID-19 infection and death? This is a very one of the most debated topics. And WHO, together with other partners, is working very hard on this, including on a very unique fund. It's called the Solidarity Fund for the COVID-19. Unique partnership between WHO, UN uh, Foundation, and also the private sector. But we have to remember one issue here, that that shortage can never be solved by market dynamics only. It will require collaborative actions. For example, lifting export bans on masks which are being stuck in particular countries. So yes, there is a need to incentivize the man manufacturer to beef up the production, including in uh, China, which is standing in solidarity now that the old brick is going down to help also Europe. But there will always be a need for solidarity within the European Union and then within the bigger Europe. And Hans, I think I'm going to keep you on the, on the spot at the moment because I have another question that I think is for you here. Vavava uh, Podgrudina from Vedomosti Business Newspaper uh, asks, how do you assess the effectiveness of measures of European governments? Have they been doing everything possible in the current circumstances? Yes, this is one of the most frequent questions I get. I think whether we are too early or too late is next to the point. The point is... We know what needs to be done. It's a new virus. We take it very seriously. But let's again put in a little bit of a positive message here. China, South Korea, Singapore, countries have really succeeded to contain and push back. So we need a whole of government approach, a whole of society approach. One, contain the epidemic. Two, prepare the hospitals. Three, mobilize the communities. And that is exactly what it meant when Dr. Tedros, the WHO Director General, declared a pandemic. It is to scale up, to double and triple the effort. That is what needs to be done now. Thank you very much. Okay. So we have the next question from Anna Dickman, uh, Financial Daubler, um, which is to Richard. Uh, what do you think about the Dutch approach to try and get herd immunity? Richard, I'll ask you that question first. I have a second uh, question from Anna, but maybe I can ask you to answer that first. What do you think about the Dutch approach to try to get herd immunity? So, yeah, no, as, as we heard uh, earlier, I mean, the, the, the strategy here um, for managing COVID-19 needs to be um, a blended approach involving a, a number of different arms of uh, activity. It, it needs to involve um, finding the cases, uh, isolating the cases, finding the contacts, quarantining the contacts. That's just to reduce the spread of the infection in the population. We also, in parallel, need to have in place the measures um, to 
in, increase um, social distancing um, and in parallel to that, uh, other measures um, to strengthen the healthcare system to be ready for the uh, up and coming kind of surge in cases as, as they come. Um, people talk about this issue of, of, of herd immunity, but I think this is what we need to focus on really is um, containing and suppressing the um, COVID-19 activity to, to flatten the curve, to buy time for the health system to prepare to be ready for the increase in cases once they come and reach our, our health systems. Uh, Dorit, anything to add on this question? Uh, th thank you very much. I, just to add that um, we do not have enough evidence about the herd immunity, and I think it's, um, it's not the right time for us to recommend it. We have to really check and know more about it. What we do know is that it is a new virus, as our regional director just said. It's a 12-week -week old virus in the human race. I mean, before it was alive, but somewhere else. Now it is with us. It's a new virus, and we have to learn it. Is it a virus that causes immunity, or is it something like influenza that changes and needs to be, uh, we have to trace it every year and race after it? So we don't know enough. And at this time, the, as we said, the comprehensive package of this very basic public and health needs to be tackled. Later on, we might be smarter. Thank you. Thanks very much. I think you both uh, very nicely covered Anna's question, and that was also an answer to Bevan Shields from the Sydney Morning Herald, who asked a similar question. Um, so we'll move over now to a, a journalist from HEDG um, called Tatev Katatrinian. Um, what kind of precautions should people take if they are in a coronavirus risk zone? Richard. Um, yeah, no, thanks um, for this question. So, I mean, this again is measures really around um, protecting yourself and protecting um, those around you. So, I think as we sort of discussed earlier, again, this is really around um, these very simple measures to reduce your, your risk of being infected and your risk of spreading it. So, really washing your hands often um, and uh, respiratory hygiene. Um, if you do fall unwell with the respiratory illness, stay at home so you don't spread it on to others. And really keep your distance um, from the people around you. So stay at least one meter away um, to reduce the risk of uh, infection from, from others. And again, just follow the local guidance that is there, that there may be special recommendations in place, and just follow that. Um, and um, that should hopefully keep, um, keep people safe. So over and out. Great, very straightforward. Thank you very much for uh, very clear. Um, next to Camilla Hodgson from the Financial Times. And this is also a question for you, Richard. Um, are some countries able to test more people per day than others? And if so, how? What's the average and what should we aim for? Okay, no, thanks very much, Rob. Um, so, again, I mean, the, just within the European region, as we heard from the regional director, um, we have 53 member states. They vary considerably um, in um, their economic level and their ability to um, test um, cases. Um, so, uh, we, we really need to sort of think very carefully on strategies here, and Double Joe has been very clear on. Um, the testing strategy and how that evolves depending on the stage a country's at. Um, so in those early stages when the country is seeing the first cases, it's really focused on testing them all, and the country should have the capacity to do that. As you come through into the later stages um, with the cluster and community transmission stage, then there may then be requirements um, to prioritise testing, focus on testing, the more severely unwell individuals, those individuals who are in hospital, um, to ensure that they're identified and appropriately managed, the healthcare workers are kept safe, and those individuals with milder disease can be managed at home, in the community, um, kept out of circulation to avoid onward spread. And the requirement for testing for those isn't so essential. So 
clearly in some settings they may have the capacity to do that, but in those that don't, that is still an effective strategy as part of all the other social distancing measures to try and um, bring the infection under control, to flatten the curve, to buy time for the health system to prepare over and out. Thank you very much. Thanks, Richard. And uh, the next question comes from Badia Afshin from Iran International TV, and it's for you, Hans. Um, will Europe as an epicenter act beyond its borders and support other communities like Iran, which struggles with the COVID-19 outbreak? If so, how? Thank you. We believe in a global world. And yes, we are sitting here in the WHO premises for the Regional Office for Europe, but we act as a one WHO. In fact, this morning, we had the region director of the African region connected on Thursday, we'll have the region director of the West Pacific. Every day, there is a health security council with the WHO director general, Dr. Tedros, and my five peers, the six region directors. So absolutely, support is around leaving no one behind. Europe has demonstrated its solidarity when it started. We also count very much on the other regions to support the WHO European region. And there is no any reason why uh, support to Iran would, uh, would not happen. In fact, the uh, embassy of Iran approached also our WHO representative in Moscow in the Russian Federation to discuss this, and these discussions are being taken forth. If there's any very specific question, please do not hesitate to write us bilaterally. Absolutely, great, thank you. And the next question from Marco Lillo at uh, Il Fato Quotidiano. What do you suggest to do in Italy? Tracing and testing with the keys in Hubei and in the whole of China. Italy is doing enough on these two issues. I think that's a question. Sorry, let me rephrase that. Is Italy doing enough on these two issues? Uh, maybe we'll go to Richard first and then Dorit next. Uh, Richard. Yes. Um, so, uh, yeah, Italy is clearly um, the country really in Europe who uh, has experienced widespread transmission um, first. So we're very much learning um, from Italy, um, from their experiences, from the interventions and so on that they've employed. But they're really taking this um, extremely seriously. Um, uh, the WHO joint mission with the CDC um, visited the country and helped um, to um, work with the Italian authorities um, on the local response um, and the measures which Italy are introducing again it is this blended approach of um, social distancing um, identifying cases uh, restricting people's movement with the aim really of trying to dampen down transmission to again hopefully reduce the pressures on the healthcare system which of course they are really experiencing to, uh, to the nth degree um, and um, re really something for the rest of the, the, the region to, to, to learn from in terms of uh, what measures to introduce and when, over and out. Thanks very much. And uh, uh, Dorit, please. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, what we see from Italy is that they have to really move very quickly from few cases to many cases. And uh, what the actions taken and uh, we commend what they have been doing in that short window that they actually had between those few cases and hundreds of cases. This was like a fire. For that, they, they, what we are saying since the beginning, please focus also on identifying already the first cases so that we can identify them and track them. When it comes at this very short window, it, it is challenging and at that point what you see is the full strain on the uh, hospital and the uh, clinical care and the community. At that time everything is being done in the right way and uh, yes also we have to remember the dem demography of Italy and many European countries. These are more elderly than we see in other countries. If we look at the South Korea data, yes it is it works well, but if you look well at the data, you see that it's mostly younger women at that group, those that got sick. This makes a 
whole lot of difference. So let's look country by country at the data. We are following the curve, that is an epi curve, and we see which action needs to be taken at each of the states. And these scenarios, Italy is following very closely those scenarios. Thank you. Thanks very much. And maybe we stay with Italy and Hans, maybe you could say a few words about how WHO is collaborating, collaborating and supporting Italy today and in the past. Italy was one of the three countries where we had a rapid response team. So very shortly after the issue uh, was uh, increasing exponentially with a team in Rome to work hand in hand with the Instituta Superior di Sanità, the leading public health institute and the Ministry of Health. And I really would like to express my appreciation to Minister Speranza himself for, from the very beginning, very transparently sharing the data. Because I always say, Italy is now the platform of know-how in Europe. So what we're doing in Italy is not only for Italy, but Italy is doing for Europe and the rest of the world. And then we also have the a very intensified work with the different regions in Italy as the health system competency also lays with the regions and then working hand in hand with the Civic Protection Committee which is the ultimate body which is convening the national level with the regions. So we are, as we speak, learning every single day in different fields whether it's clinical management, infection control and prevention and uh, epidemiology. Super, thanks very much, Hans. And a quick question for you, Dorit, um, from Isabel Sacco from EFE. Uh, how much does it cost a coronavirus test? Do we have the, do we, do you have that knowledge? Yeah, the coronavirus test cost, it depends on the country uh, scale, but it's about uh, 30 to $60, depending on the scale. And uh, therefore, some countries have to be very, a kind of a economical and efficient in using it. Um, it is something that we are thinking about. There are more cheaper tests that are in the market, but all of them have to be verified. So it's not cheap, but it is more, co more costly to be sick. So that's what we have to remember. So it's contact tracing, isolation, and the, the social distancing are important. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much indeed. Um, now, we have um, Ivan Gershkovich from the Moscow Times. Uh, Dorit, this is also a question for you. Um, has WHO sent laboratory tests to the Russian Federation? If so, uh, when did the organization or how many of the organization sent them when? It's very specific. We sent Russian Federation. Yeah. Well, I'm very happy to say that the Russian Federation is helping us and helping us to support and supply their neighboring countries and many countries that we have been doing it hand in hand. So the Russians have the capacity, they are producing and at a good level and we are using their tests as well. Thank you. Very good, thanks very much. Um, so Richard, we've got we've just got time for a couple more questions. I'm going to go to Richard on the next one. Um, are are lockdowns good or bad? So I'm assuming this is referring to country lo countries locking themselves down as a preventive measure or as a or as a national measure. Are lockdowns good or bad? And that comes from Christian Orlik from the DPA. Yeah, no, thanks, thanks for, for, for that question. So. I mean, this again comes back to the strategies around social distancing and trying to reduce spread of the virus in the population. Um, and countries need to look very carefully at the blended approach that they want to use um, to try to do this. There are a range of strategies that you can use. Um, the idea of lockdowns has been used in places like China and also more recently in Italy to really kind of reduce the movement of people to try to limit spread um, so that they can play a role. Um, it, 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 but of course, there also elements to it as well on the side of ensuring that um, people's morale and social acceptability is maintained as well. So there are, there are risks and there are benefits, but um, we're obviously dealing here with a, a virus that um, requires a whole gamut of interventions to try to bring it under control. And at least in some scenarios, lockdowns may be part 
um, of, of, of the menu that's needed. Over and out. Great stuff. Thanks very much. Now, we're rapidly approaching the top of the hour, but I'm just going to ask uh, Hans, we've got one more question here from uh, Adam Vaughan and the New Scientist magazine. The UK dramatically escalated its response measures to the virus yesterday. Do they go far enough? And is the UK doing enough on testing? It has stopped testing for people with mild symptoms. Yes, so we are very pleased to see that indeed the United Kingdom is getting into the mainstream and stepping up its efforts, because the UK has a, is, I would say, the bacon of public health in the WHO European region. So we applaud this uh, very much. Comes back to the basic measures that we know are working. Contain the outbreak, strengthen your health system capacity, and number three, mobilize your community, but in doubling and tripling the effort. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks very much. And uh, I think on that note, we can uh, thank everybody for, we've just got one more question. Excuse me, sorry, I've just heard the ping go here. Um, let's see. Um, what are the WHO guidelines for countries where hospitals are reaching maximum capacity? That's just in from Jenny Ravello at DevEx. Um, what are the WHO guidelines for countries where hospitals are reaching maximum capacity? Uh, can we send that over to you, Dorit? Yes, thank you. As we discussed earlier, prioritization is a key. We are trying to prioritize the actions and the procedures in the hospital so that only those that really need to be hospitalized will be hospitalized. Also, emergency medical teams, our uh, initiative and partnerships with organizations are coming side by side with governments that need help. And we have already some of our emergency medical, medical teams uh, deployed. In some areas, they even moved to very innovative approach of drive through to do some testing. So we have to be very innovative and to find a way to ensure that those who need the care get it. And uh, we are ready to work with you. Thanks. Okay, wonderful. Thanks, Dwight. And I can see that there are more questions now rolling in. We'll endeavor to respond to those questions uh, bilaterally with you in writing. Uh, but if I could just turn now to the Regional Director, Hans, Dr. Hans Kluger, to, to close. Thanks. Thank you very much, Rob, and thank you to my colleagues and everyone connecting. I always say that I count on the media as a part of the public health effort. Public health is defined as the organized effort of society to prolong life and prevent disease. So you have really a very important and ethical duty on the reporting, also to push back the infodemic of fake news and report according to the guidance of the national authorities and WHO. Every one of us has a responsibility to contain and slow down the outbreak, and solidarity is key, psychological resilience is key, and to walk the talk. Thank you, and I wish us all to stay healthy and take care of those who are sick. Thank you and have a nice day.